Ok, hello everyone. Buongiorno. Come sta? Uh, I'm stoked to join this amazing conference. First, I have to thank Synesthesia for organizing this amazing event. And personally, I want to thank, thank Francesco and Lucy for having me. And thank you, everyone, for coming. It, it is really great to see all you here. For those of you who don't know who I am, just a little introduction. My name is Julia. I'm a macOS engineer at MacPo, Clean My Mac team, security. Uh, our products are installed on every fifth Mac on the planet. But funny thing, our company is not known by that fact. It is more known by having cats at the office. Thank you. So please meet Hoover and Fixel. I know it's been quite a conference and you can be pretty tired by now, but these two guys are going to help us to get through. So if you see a random cat, it's just to grab your attention. Uh, also, I do some volunteering. I'm a MacOS chapter lead at Women Who Code Kiev. Uh, this year, I've been a mentor on a workshop on Swift Aware, a Portuguese iOS conference. And I'm also one of founders of local technical meetup series hosted by our company, MacPort Tech Talks. So, for the next 40 minutes or something, we are going to talk about Swift code reuse and how to do it in style. Or at least it was the plan. Then I decided that it's not that interesting for someone, probably, and I need to go with a more demanded topic. Funny animals. I mean, it is important, right? We need to have time to play with our pets, and we all want to make those nice pictures, and we want to post them and all the stuff, but yeah, we need time for that. That may be thinking that to have some time, we probably need to finish our work early. You see where I'm going, right? I know that you do. We don't have to write one thing over and over again. We don't have to invent the wheel. We, don't, we can reuse our code efficiently. So I decided to go with frameworks and libraries, because it's going to help us to have some free time with our pets. Uh, to give you more context, I'll start by looking at my experience behind this talk. Of course, I had project with one target, probably as everyone here. Uh, everything was, all the files were included in one target. That's it, the application. You don't need to complicate things more than necessary, I think. I had apps that contained several apps. I worked at C++ libraries that were shared between our team, macOS, and the Linux team, and also on projects that had dozens of dependencies. Most of them were internal. So I hope this experience can help you to make your projects better. The biggest one I was working on was an application, a workspace, that consisted of 27 projects. Each project had up to 14 targets. So you can imagine this stuff. And we did it the way that it was flexible and it was not the overhead. So let's see what we are going to do today. We are going to start with the why. Why should we separate the code base into different chunks? When can it help us? We are going to proceed with the how. How we do it. Static, dynamic libraries, frameworks, modules, all those buzzwords and well-known words. We are going to talk briefly on dependency management. And I'm going to give you some takeaways. I really hope that some of you will start thinking about splitting your code 
into different targets and libraries after this talk, and I want to help you with that. So, the why. We all probably had this thing when we have this target, our application, then we have an extension to our application, and we put the second tick mark. We want to include the file into, into both targets because we need this functionality. Um, so we compile it twice. We put it into both executables. And both executables become a little bit bigger. And it doesn't like, feel right, you know? You know the notion of code smell in Swift? Like um, when you see an exclamation mark, a force and rep. That's the point when you say, OK, something's going on here. Yes, that's the code smell. And this is just another level of code smell. That's the same force and rep, but done on a higher level. OK, we have it. What, what can we get out of improving it? First, if we compile less, if we separate, if we take our class that's, that has to be included in several targets and include it in one target, like a library or anything, what do we get? First, we get faster compilation. It's compiled once. It's not compiled like 1,000 times for our 1,000 applications. Arguably, but we got faster app launch because the executable is smaller. We got a little bit of a smaller app bundle because we don't like compile a thousand classes a thousand times. We do it once because we put it into one target. New platform support comes easy. When you have your business logic separated into a library and you need to build another app, what you do? You just build another app for another platform using this library. That's it. You have everything prepared for that. You can grow your GitHub. This is the way we do it. Uh, first, you write an open source library that you need for your projects. Uh, you open sources, you put it on GitHub with a license uh, that allows usage in commercial projects and uh, without attribution, probably, like MAT license, the most popular one. And then you start using it. You are the maintainer of this library, and then you become the client of this library. You start using it in your applications that you do one by one. You fix all the bugs all the way, you polish it, and other people start using it too, because it's great, because you have been improving it over time. So you do your work faster, because I have a library for that, for that, for that, and for this. You just use them. And also, you're like an amazing person who have some amazing code on GitHub. Win-win. Again, you test your library once. And then you use it. If you have bugs, you know that this one is tested. I've used it like in a dozen projects. What can go wrong here? And the most important thing for me, I'm a fan of learning, if I can say so. When you think about making a library interface, you start thinking on a whole new level. It's not like a pattern. You bu I built my application on Viper for, Viper, for example, or anything, or I use Builder or something else. You have to think on a high level of abstraction. You need to provide the interface that other clients are going to use. And you are going to be one of your clients, probably. And you don't know what your next application will be. So you have to think in another way. And when you have a habit of doing frameworks of your own, you just do it over and over again, and you learn how to do it nicely. Um, you know, let's see how one very successful company does it. I thought, Apple team writes tremendous amounts of code, right? And they need to reuse it. So can we peek somehow how they do it 
is there a way to look behind the curtain? There is. This is my system library frameworks directory. It has 172 items in it, and they are all frameworks. Well, you can say they do system programming. I do application programming, different th things. I say it doesn't matter. It is the way you think as a programmer. When you see a distant piece of code that does something, you put it to another static dynamic library framework, whatever, to another chunk. And it is an idea. It is a full functionality. Not everything merged just in one app, and then you have to redo everything again. 172. Can you imagine how much time they have saved? But how do we get there? How do we get to the point when we have, like, I don't do my own libraries to the point I do them a lot? I've seen this evolution. I think we all start with this, yeah, it works. That's it, I'm done. OK, this is amazing. And you are satisfied with yourself only because it's your work. Then some time comes and you say, OK, I want to do it the right way. And you put it into different classes. And you're like, OK, I did this. I used this pattern and that pattern. Then you try to reuse this code because it's you use the patterns and classes and all the objective or object oriented programming. And you understand that you need to do it again because it takes some experience to make classes like really reusable. This is the point when we can already think on level of classes. And what I'm talking about is the next level. The level when you think in terms of functionality, in, term, in terms of problem and solution, not a class. So let's proceed with how we do it part. I prepared a small quiz for you. It's called versus quiz. It's versus because we are going to learn new things by comparing them one to, one to another. And let's start with the basics. Static dynamic. Please, raise your hands who is sure to know that he or she knows the difference between static dynamic libraries, like who, who can say, I know it. Please raise your hands. OK, many people raise their hands, but they're like, what? <laughs> we are going to figure this out right now. We are going to talk about static linking, static libraries. This is basically a typical static library. You have some code compiled into a file, and you have some headers. Normally, the file has the A extension. Uh, for example, we have our amazing notes application. This is how the library I showed you looks into this application. You don't see it, right? Am I lying to you? OK, uh, probably many of you raised your hands. They know that it's hidden in, inside this macOS amazing notes file. It's built into it. And we don't need the headers in the built application. So yes, the library is over there, but we can't see it. Basically, it's our executable file. And there is some of your code and some of your static library code just appended over there. It is called static linking. Now you basically know everything you need about static libraries and static linking. Dynamic libraries. Dynamic linking. A typical dynamic library looks pretty the same way. You can see one difference, this dialib extension, a compiled file, and some headers. That's it. Um, OK. It was easy, right? 
let's go with another question. Who can say that he or she knows the difference between a library and framework and can explain it? What's the difference? OK, less hands, but still. I figured this is a pretty uh, popular query. It comes down to people ask uh, a difference between a library and an API, and it comes down to a difference between a liberal and a cannibal. OK, we're not going to cover this today. This is a typical scheme. I was doing my research, and I found this scheme on several websites. It's pretty laconic, and it just tells us everything, right? Well, I don't know what it tells us, honestly. All those explanations, I think they bring more confusion. So let's, let's figure out correctly who contains what and who calls whom. Let's start with the library. Conceptually, library doesn't affect the life cycle of our app or our objects. Uh, technically, as you have seen, it is a file and, a he and headers. And technically, it can be static or dynamic. So there is a nice tech example, estadelib, OK? But there is a caveat. For example, Coco Lumberjack, SDWAP Image, AF Networking, they look like they are frameworks. But in their meaning, they are libraries because they use them. You use them. You call them. I'm going to show you in a minute what, it's gonna, what it means. This, you've seen already an example of a library, so it's just the framework. Conceptually, it is something that affects the life cycle of our apps or objects. Technically, it's just a directory with a dynamic library and bells and whistles, and that's it. Uh, a good example is UIKit, because we built our logic, we built our application on a framework, upon it. And we, our logic lives in some kind of callbacks, like delegate callbacks, for example. This is when you see that it is a framework, because it's a big stuff that you use, and you live in its callbacks, for example. Um, this is probably some kind of typical framework. It can have a module map, some resources, images, an info list file, headers, usually. And of course, a uh, compiled executable framework showcase Unix executable you can see here. There is no dilib extension, but it is a dynamic library. It is linked dynamically. So let's recap. Static library is basically code and headers. And it is embedded into the app executable. Dynamic library is basically the same thing, but the file of the library lives. OK, the library has its own executable file in our built app or somewhere. It doesn't live in the executable of the app of the client. It's not built in. And framework is basically dynamic library with bells and whistles. Next one, library and module. Who knows, who can explain, who understands the difference between a library and a module? Please raise your hand. OK, 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 great. We're going to make it more for us. If we open the docs, we, we can read that module is a single unit of a code distribution, a framework, or an application. Or basically, I don't know, whatever. I don't know why, why they do so high-level explanations. I don't know what, what to do with them. Because it's pretty easy. A module is basically just a new fancy type of header. And that's it. And it contains no implementation. The implementation lives in a static or a dynamic library. 
So now you see why we started with this old stuff, static dynamic libraries. Everything else is just built upon it. If you understand static and dynamic libraries and linking, you basically understand everything else. Not many people know that there are two types of modules in our Xcode projects. First, clan modules. Clan modules are supported by Objective-C, Swift, and many, many, many other languages. A clan module is one file, module.modulemap. That's it. You probably have read about them or even done some by yourselves. The second one is Swift module. It is supported, surprise, surprise, by Swift only. It consists of two files, Swift doc and Swift module. Swift doc is parse docu documentation, Swift model is headers. That's it. So, now you know what a module is. Let's go to another interesting topic. What to choose? Let's vote. Let's vote, really. Who votes for Swift Package Manager? Please raise your hands. OK. OK. Now, who votes for CocoaPods? Please raise your hands. OK, more votes for CocoaPods, I see. OK. We're going to figure this out better. Tim, you need to do more talks on Swift Package Manager, I think. Um, CocoaPods versus SPM. CocoaPods supports Swift. OK, if SPM supports Swift, Swift Package Manager does. CocoaPod supports Objective-C. SPM supports Objective-C, as we all know, but it doesn't support mixed targets, so I, I'd love to wait until they support mixed language targets, Swift plus Objective-C, Swift plus C, something like that. CocoaPod has no Xcode integration, and I don't think that they're going to get one. And since Xcode 11, in SPM, we have first class, amazing Xcode integration. CocoaPods have no explicit multi-platform support. What I mean by that? If you want your library to be built for iOS, tvOS, watchOS, macOS, you need to make targets for each platform. You remember this when you download some pod from CocoaPods and you have like five, for example, supported platforms, you need only one and you're like, you can get rid of them. Um, SPM is platform agnostic, which is amazing. It figures out stuff when you are going to build it. It looks at your destination for example, I, bid f I built for watchOS now, and it builds for watchOS. Of course, CocoaPods support resources. Unfortunately, SPM doesn't. But you know, this is what happened when I was like flying here. On November 19, they are finishing to review the resources support. So we are going to have resources in SPM real, real soon. Um, we have uh, an application in our company. It's not published yet. It is almost released. It's going to be released like in a week or something. And I approached their main developer. They're using SPM as the main as the, and the only dependency manager. And I asked what he thinks about it. He could choose either CocoaPods or Carthage or anything. He decided to try SPM. And this is what he told me. Looks like he likes it very much. And he says that you paste a GitHub link and you're in game. You all know what that means. OK, let's see. It's literally, you paste it and it works. You press, you go to general tab, you press plus under frameworks, libraries, and embedded content. And you have this add package dependency, and you can search there. It's going to search on GitHub, I think. And you can just paste the link. That's it. You have your package. 
it's like, it's not even two minutes, it's faster. Funny thing about static and dynamic libraries is that what should we choose, right? SPM has an interesting feature. If you don't specify what do you want out of it, you say, I want a library. You can specify the type, but they say in docs you, that you have to leave this parameter unspecified to let Swift Package Manager figure this out itself. Um, I haven't seen it actually doing any dynamic frameworks. I see that it usually creates a static framework for us. Static library, I'm, I'm sorry, a static library for us. But probably after we have resources added, we're gonna have more dynamic linking in it. So, some takeaways. We started with static libraries that were embedded in, into our application. Then we went to dynamic libraries that can live on their own, in their own files. Then we got frameworks and modules and other wrappers around dynamic libraries. And then we got Swift packages that can figure out by themselves what they need. Some practical advices. When should you think about separating your code in another target? Well, the first trigger is pretty obvious. We've talked about that at the beginning. If you include your file in more than one target, you probably need a library for that. Another trigger is when you have a group of classes with, that perform one action. OK, that's probably a candidate for a library. Another question, what do we put there? Anything? For example, if you have some transport logic networking, sockets, whatever, you can put it away from your code. Uh, all of us, many of us probably have some foundation enhancements. It is a pretty good candidate for a library. Many applications have logic for trial limitations and license management. Very good candidate to put into a library, a static library probably, because uh, you want to make it harder for people to find it. You don't want to have a separate file that says, you can reverse engineer me and break the app, right? Uh, working with the database, another good candidate. Analytics services. For example, you have Google Analytics, and then you have another service added. If you have everything wrapped in a library, you don't have direct calls to Google Analytics Manager or whatever you have in your app. You can just add it in one place in the library. If you don't, you will have to add it in all the places, which doesn't look good. Basically, every new feature is a really good candidate for a library. I think it is OK if your app has like five major features and you have five libraries for that. In previous talk, it was mentioned that um, there can be more. So you need to understand every new feature, but you don't want to have 70 frameworks linking to your code. It's too much. Now, OK, you found your piece of code that you want to design. And what's the interface? Where do you get the interface? First, there are actually like five rules, I think, that we can follow and that can help us. A low flexible configuration for the client. So receive everything in parameters and use it. So the client can configure how you behave in a very flexible way, in the way they want it. Also, allow simple default setup with no arguments or with few arguments, because not everyone wants want this, that flexibility. Next, if you are doing something, allow a synchronous 
execution with completion handler, probably progress handler, stuff like that. Don't block the thread for a long time. Just return immediately and return the result in completion handlers or whatever. Use Apple frameworks. As an example, if you are doing some delegate calls, look how it's done in, by Apple. For example, here you can see in the table view delegate call that table view first has to introduce itself. And it's actually, it's a rule. And you might know it, you might not know it, but if you follow the pattern, you're going to do it right. Also, you can use other famous frameworks and libraries as an example. For example, if you're doing uh, logging library, we can use Coco Lumberjack as an example. We can see that it, in some places it allows really flexible setup, log, asynchronous with levels, flags, context, file, and all the stuff. And in other places, it's really simple. One call with one parameter. That's it. So you can use some of that in your applications. And the last one. If I start today, what should I do? We were talking libraries, frameworks, dynamic, static, too much. So key takeaways. I'd go with frameworks. Not 70, please. But still, they are very, very nicely supported. And it is, I see some people laughing over there, and I'm going to try to guess why. There was a talk earlier when it was told that you can go from dynamic libraries to static, so you can um, launch faster. You have to balance this. If you have a small library, probably it is better to put it in your executable, and that's it, if it's really small. If it's big, you might want to have a separate file. If you have very, very much, like 70, you're going to have problems. That's it. Just probably don't have 70 depend external dependencies. Don't try to load everything. So it's OK to put everything in pieces, but you don't have to put everything in the smallest pieces. It's not something I can explain from the stage. It's something you just need to come to with common sense. Static and dynamic linking both have advantages and disadvantages. So I say go with frameworks. If you have any problems, think about it, analyze it, profile it, Probably think about switching to static libraries somewhere. But if, you, if and when you have problems. If we are talking about dependency management, I say Swift Package Manager. We have it almost in production in our company in a pretty big application, and we are happy. So I think that it's a good start. And Swift Package Manager is our future. Thank you very much.